a determined man who recognized his destiny, his wealth, his purpose, and was willing to live and die for them all. At the time when he was growing up, he had no idea that he would be the one to be the leader of the movement. But by the grace of God, we believe he became that leader. Close friends, the two reverends, Martin Luther King and James Peters, experienced the pressure of segregation in America. The churches were deeply segregated. The YMCA was segregated. Vern Howard, chairman of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday Commission and project manager of the world-renowned Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Monument in Denver. Believe it or not, segregation has been in America since America's been America. However, Martin Luther King paved the way to a brighter future. Dr. King, first of all, his real name was Michael. He was six years old when his father changed both their names to Martin Luther after the 14th century religious leader. He grew up in the midst of all of the segregation that is known to the Deep South, but with a father who was a Baptist minister and a mother who was a retired school teacher. Dr. King never saw color. It was something that was strange for him. His best friend was a Caucasian young man, and at the age of 10, while they were outside playing, the Caucasian's mother said, come in, you can no longer play with that, and she used the N-word. And the young man looked around and said, this is not a using the N-word, he says, this is Martin. And she says, he is still, and she used the N-word. That's when Dr. King said he first noticed the different colors of skin. After graduating high school at 15, he went to study at Morehouse College and from there went to Corsier University in Boston where he got his doctorate in theology. At an early age, Dr. King had adopted and embraced the nonviolent way of life. Martin taught us and we all taught other people that physical violence was neither moral or practical. At 26, Martin Luther King moved to Montgomery, Alabama with his wife and young daughter in 1955. During this time, the bus system was deeply segregated. The black passengers would have to get on the bus in the front, pay their fare, exit the bus from the front, and get back on in the rear. They could not walk through the white section. Rosa Parks remained seated on a bus after being told by a white man to get up. She refused to do it and was subsequently arrested. And the community got together and organized the bus boycott, where people said, if we can't serve and be treated fairly on the buses, then we won't ride them. Martin Luther King was working as a pastor at a Baptist church in Montgomery. You have to understand that in the black community, the church was the center of community life. And the minister was the one person who was free to speak out against the system. Rosa Parks first heard Dr. King speak in August of 1955. She made the comment that we finally have something here. Dr. King became the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association to lead the bus boycott. People got a chance to hear him speak and understand how well he articulated not only the problems of segregation, but the solutions to rise up and fight, but not physically. Initially looking to desegregate the buses on black routes, King and many others began the 381-day boycott of Montgomery's public transportation system. Well, the victory came about and was so paramount because they overturned segregation on the buses altogether. There was no longer a colored section and a white section. It was just one bus, first come, first serve. King went on to serve as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957, which continued the nonviolent protests for equality throughout the South. People came to realize that this could happen anyway, and it was a part of the whole picture of discrimination in the South. And so in Albany, Georgia, we had the first massive fill up the jail type of demonstrations. It got bigger when we came to Birmingham in 1963. I was there five different times. And many times we would just fill up the jail. They had laws in cities like Birmingham stopping people from parading without a license. The city refused to give the SCLC permission to march, yet they marched anyway. Martin, who was in the leadership of most of those marches, was arrested right away. I think he was arrested 32 different times. 
A group of white ministers wrote a letter to Dr. King while he was in jail, complaining about the fact that he was upsetting the city and it might cause violence, and he should urge his followers not to protest and not to march, that you're really making a lot of trouble in Birmingham. And Dr. King had written from the Birmingham jail, and he had said, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And through that quote, you will find that he was simply saying that if we do not take a stand now, then when? All the effort made in other cities led to the most famous demonstration of freedom in our nation's history, Washington, D.C., 1963. 240,000 people. At that time, the largest demonstration for freedom ever in this country. And as the afternoon wore on and people became more excited, down at the end was Martin Luther King, Jr., giving that famous I Have a Dream speech. We must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. It was immediately much more than just a speech that somebody gave down in Washington. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. At the age of 35, on December 10, 1964, Dr. King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Peace Prize has never been accepted in an atmosphere of people singing, We Shall Overcome, and being involved in that glory and honor of Martin being named the person in the world who had done the most for freedom, justice, and equality, and peace. In February of 1968, Dr. King went to Memphis, Tennessee to help lead 13,000 striking sanitation workers. All the garbage collectors were black, and all of them were very low paid, and some had gotten killed in improper equipment, and so there rose up a labor dispute there, and Martin came in to help them. Dr. King received over 200 death threats leading up to the trip to Memphis. And for the first time, these death threats had a recurring theme. It wasn't the wacko who's, we're just gonna blow you up and kill you, we don't give a who to nothing. It wasn't that, this time they were organized. You can come to Memphis, but you're leaving one way dead. You can come to Memphis, but you're leaving one way feet first. You can come to Memphis, but you're leaving as a dead man. I just wanna do God's will. And he has allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. When Dr. King backed away from the podium, you could see that he had came to terms with everything that was going on. They said the next morning he woke up like a brand new person, laughing, joking, had a pillow fight with Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson. That morning at the Lorraine Motel, Martin Luther King and many other ministers were waiting for their ride. And Dr. King went out on the balcony and was talking to Jesse Jackson, who was down in the parking lot, when they heard the recoil of the rifle. And and Martin was gone, shot down fighting for the rights of garbage collectors. What are we gonna do? He was by far the most important, most motivating, most valuable leader in that entire movement. It was such a profound sense of loss, but there was also an immediate decision to make sure that just killing Dr. King would not kill the movement. The King Civil Rights Movement gave birth to the women's movement, the farm workers movement, the gay movement, the Latino movement. For it was Martin Luther King's hope, dream, and ultimately his soul force that made it possible for change to come about in America. A change that we still experience today.